What's poppin' Monster Kings? It's me, MT, and welcome back to this here god dang heavy spoiler show, y'all. And what's that, you say? You want a breakdown of Godzilla King of the Monsters from the year of our Lizard Lord 2019? Well, that can be arranged. Let's get it, my monster nerd babies. And y'all already know the deal. Liking this video and subscribing to the channel helps heavy spoilers to grow and lets us keep making these fun breakdowns for all of you guys. So if you guys wanna help us out, you can do just that. But if you really wanna show us that you guys care, you guys can become a member for just 99 cents a month to get access to all of our videos earlier than everybody else. I guarantee you, y'all won't even notice that dollar missing from your kitchen. But regardless of what you guys do, we're just glad that you guys are here. And even before the movie starts, we got ourselves some sweet Easter eggs when the opening Warner Brothers and Legendary logos drop, as ancient carvings of Titans can be seen around those logos. The frame with the Warner Brothers logo has what appears to be the three-headed King Ghidorah on the right, and the Kaiju Sekhmet on the left. Following this, the frame with the legendary logo includes the avian kaiju Quetzalcoatl on the left and the titan mammoth behemoth on the right. Then after we hear Godzilla's iconic scream, the movie starts off by sending us back to the events of the 2014 Godzilla film, as the red smoke from Ford Brody's halo jump onto the city of San Francisco can be seen immediately as the movie starts at the top of the frame here. The camera then descends onto the San Francisco hellscape where the Russells struggle to find little Andrew Russell, who died died when Godzilla emerged for his final battle against the Jinshin Mushi Munos at the end of Godzilla 2014. We see Emma Russell, the matriarch of the soon-to-be-broken family, stare at Godzilla in absolute shock before the scene brilliantly transitions to a numb Emma Russell staring out into the foliage outside. This was a great way to show just how much the trauma of Godzilla's attack began to start to morph Emma Russell's mind, because she's literally staring out into Mother Nature, wanting to preserve Mother Nature from the pain of losing everything, much like she lost her family following the death of her son Andrew, a son that Emma turns to face through a family photograph nearby. In that photograph, we can see a younger Madison wearing a Boston Red Sox cap, very much foreshadowing the end of the movie where Boston's Fenway Park becomes crucial to helping stop King Ghidorah with the Orca. As a TV plays in the background, the scene shifts to news footage of a protest outside the White House. One of the protest signs on the screen says the words destroy all monsters on it which is an Easter egg to the 1968 Godzilla film, Destroy All Monsters, another Godzilla film that also featured King Ghidorah, Mothra, Rodan, and Angiris like this movie does. Hold on there just a minute, MT. I do not recall any Angiris monsters making a ruckus in my Godzilla 2 Kaiju Boogaloo. So whatever are you talking about, Willis? And to that I say nay on this day, for Angiris makes a quick cameo in the movie right outside of Godzilla's subaquatic temple. Well, what's left of one of his species? Species anyway. Then the news report then talks about how a recent uptick in dead fish across the world could be linked to mankind's hunt for Godzilla, a theory that would prove to be absolutely true as we learn later on in the film that the military has been using oxygen destroyer detonations to kill kaiju. The oxygen destroyer bomb is a classic weapon from the Godzilla franchise that made its first appearance in 1954's original Godzilla film when Daisuke Serizawa used it to wipe out Godzilla from existence, sacrificing himself in the process. Godzilla King of Monsters, of course, pays tribute to this moment by having an oxygen destroyer nearly kill Godzilla and having a different Serizawa sacrifice themselves in an explosion in order to bring Godzilla back to life. But anyways, the news report ends with the reporter saying the words, the day the world discovers that monsters are real. And when that reporter does, the camera slowly zooms in onto Emma Russell's face, very much meant to foreshadow her involvement as the true monster of the movie, something that her daughter Madison would call her later on when Madison finds out that her mom is a uh, freaking lunatic. But anyways, speaking of the Russell family, I kind of like how Mark, Emma and Madison's family dynamic, kind of mirrors that of the three-headed dragon Ghidorah, a dragon whose three heads have distinct personalities. The middle head's name is Ichi and is the alpha head amongst them and thus is the one in charge of the actions of what they all do as a unit. Much like Emma Russell's headstrong nature mainly guided the course of her family by being able to manipulate Madison against her father. And since Ichi literally means one in Japanese, then it makes sense for the second smartest dragon head on the right to be named Ni, which means two. And while Ichi is far more malicious than all three of them, Ni is the far more aggressive and bloodthirsty of the bunch and is always fixing for a fight. Much like Mark Russell is throughout much of the movie when he keeps trying to tell the US military to do whatever they can to kill all the kaiju. 
Kaiju. And keeping up with the number theme, the third dragon on the left is of course named San, which means three. And because this dragon is the least intelligent of the bunch, director Mike Doherty decided to also give this third head the secondary name of Kevin, because he's as dumb as Kevin from The Office. <laughs> But while Kevin is typically known as the stupid head because he's a little slower than the rest, a lot of this guy's slow behavior is heavily attributed to their curiosity. Kevin has a far more reserved trigger finger than all of his brothers and likes to take his time to curiously observe his surroundings and the life forms around him, which are character traits that the young Madison shares. Additionally, both Kevin and Madison are also both routinely manipulated by the head in charge in order to fall in line. So it's interesting to me to see the Russell family dynamic sort of mirror King Ghidorah's in a way. But anyways, as the scene shifts to breakfast with the Russell girls, Madison is on her laptop looking through some emails. Around the unopened messages from her father, we can see an email from the Boston Globe newspaper linking to an article about the mysterious radiation emitted by the kaiju having been linked to a startling regrowth of vegetation in those regions. Emma Russell brings this very scientific discovery up later on in the movie when she reveals her true motivations behind her eco-terrorist activities. She wants to have all the monsters hiding within the planet to emerge so that they can walk around stomping on humanity while their radiation triggers rapid vegetation growth throughout the crumbled remains of global society. And you know what? As batshit insane as all of that is, I kind of see where Emma Russell is coming from. I mean, while I'm not co-signing the actions of this cuckoo science lady, this is clearly a woman that desperately needed the random chaos of Godzilla's arrival to make sense, because that act of nature is what led to the death of her son Andrew. So Emma chose to ease the pain of her loss by choosing to believe that her son died as part of some grand plan formulated by Mother Nature in order to save the planet as a whole by exterminating humanity. I mean, human beings are an extremely destructive species to the habitat of the planet after all, and it's primarily the wildlife that tends to suffer as a result of all that. So she felt like she was doing humanity a favor in the long run, but all she was really trying to do was trying to find her own logic behind the monster chaos that led to Andrew's demise. The sheer weight of the revelation that titans exist on the planet and can easily kill your fragile family members caused Emma to snap. And that snapped mindset gave her a desperation to try to make sense of her new nonsensical monster reality. But anyways, as Madison continues down her messages, we can see a February 28th, 2018 NPR news article about Dolph an echolocation, something that Joe Brody was studying in Godzilla 2014 in order to uncover the mystery behind the Janjira plant meltdown, and a field that brought Maddie's parents, Emma and Mark, together while they were both studying animal bioacoustics at MIT, which eventually led them to settling down in Boston, which is why the Red Sox are a big part of this family's life. With their big nerdy science brains combined, Emma and Mark would make the Orca Animal Acoustic Replicating Device, originally intended to help whales and dolphins navigate their way away from the shore. But once Emma learned that the orca could also be used to communicate with titans, she started developing a new version of the orca to do just that after her and her husband separated. But anyways, after this, an eco news alert about climate change to illustrate just how badly the planet has been ruined by humanity can be seen, followed by a June 13, 2018 article from the New Scientist magazine from author Penny Sarchet about humanity slowly zoning in on the place on Earth where life started 4 billion years ago. Then after this, there's an email linking to a June 23rd, 2015 National Geographic article by Nadia Drake asking if humanity can survive the sixth great extinction with the article pointing out how the planet Earth has undergone five great cataclysms in the past that nearly wiped out all life on Earth. With Drake referencing climate change, the Ice Age, volcanoes, and meteors as examples of such apocalyptic events. So, needless to say, Emma Russell made sure that her daughter grew up as climate conscious as she was, further illustrating just how much Emma was trying to morph her daughter into being like her. Then, when Madison finally checks the email that she's been ignoring from her dad, we can see that Mark Russell has been away spending his time taking nude photographs of wolves in the wild like the freak that he is. I'm joking, but since Mark Russell did spend his life studying apex predators and how animals communicate, he's been spending most of his time studying the vocal patterns of wolves after the death of Andrew caused him to become estranged from his family after a period 
period of grief-fueled alcoholism. But anyways, as Maddie listens to Wave of Mutilation by the Pixies, she begins emailing her father back, telling him that she's worried about her crazy-ass mom. After said crazy-ass mom walks into the kitchen of burning bacon, we can get a clear look at the top of Maddie's laptop, where we can see the head of Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty stickered on, next to stickers of a monkey and a dinosaur, possible Easter eggs alluding to Kong and Godzilla respectively. As Emma goes to turn off the fire alarm, we can see a figure of a golden bird at the top of this kitchen cabinet here, directly facing the alarm, a possible tease to how the golden-winged Ghidorah would face the direction of the Orca device later on in the movie. Then, after Emma reveals to her daughter that she finally got the orca working, the kitchen ominously shakes, causing a photograph of Emma and her mother to fall, foreshadowing the future events of the film where the orca would be the cause of Emma and Madison's deteriorated relationship. And we quickly find out that all of that rumbling was happening as a consequence of the two living on a monarch outpost based in the Chinese Yunnan rainforest, where a mothra egg was just about ready to hatch after sitting inside of an ancient Chinese temple dedicated to Mothra for a long ass time. If you remember from the post credit scene of Kong Skull Island, ancient artwork of Mothra could be seen referenced alongside those of Rodan, Godzilla, and King Ghidorah very much meant to tease the events of this second Godzilla movie. After spending decades collecting these types of ancient clues pointing to Mothra, Monarch eventually had a bunch of their agents head to China in 2009, eventually coming across Mothra's cocoon in this ancient temple of the moth. Monarch would immediately contact Emma Russell to use her orca device in order to study the sounds and life signs of the creature. So Emma has pretty much been studying Mothra's cocoon at Monarch Outpost 61 for about 10 years when we first meet her in Godzilla 2. Outpost 61 is actually an easter egg for the year 1961, which is the year the first Mothra solo movie came out. When designing Mothra, the production wanted to underscore Mothra's femininity, as Mothra was one of the few female monsters in the classic monsterverse. To that end, they decided to make Mothra glow with a bioluminescence to make her feel like a feminine angel as her role in the MonsterVerse was meant to be as a protector and champion for life, as well as one of Godzilla's greatest homies. In the movie, she uses her bioluminescence in order to convey her emotional state, changing colors as those emotions fluctuate. And partly because of this, much like in the classic Godzilla films, Mothra was worshipped like a god for the ancient people of the region. Most of the titans in the MonsterVerse were actually revered as deities or demons by ancient civilizations, which is why the movie literally starts with us seeing carvings of people bowing down to monsters as the Warner Brothers and legendary logos pop up, imagery that we see replicated when Monarch heads down to Godzilla's subaquatic temple home. Mothra was also closely modeled off of praying mantises, believe it or not, in particular her front legs that she uses to attack. But in order to make her a more formidable opponent in a world full of kaiju, the production opted to give Mothra a stinger as well. And seeing as Mothra is the queen of the monsters next to her King Godzilla, the movie also made sure that the queen was always repping her king on the streets by including the design of Godzilla's eyes on her wings, which I thought was a really nice touch. But anyways, as Emma and Madison make their way to the lab, we can see a bit of Emma's caring nature come out as she tries to get her colleague Tim to leave the premises before Alan Jonah and his mercenaries show up. But Tim, being a massive moth nerd who wanted to see a caterpillar wake up from their sleep, declines her offer to get some sleep himself. But unfortunately for Tim, he would be forced into the deepest sleep of all through a uh, metal sleeping pill to the head, causing all of his nerdy moth knowledge to drip all over the floor. Lesson of the day, if your boss tells you to go home early, go home early. It's not worth it. <laughs> But anyways, a little bit after Titanus Mosura is born and triggers Monarch's warning system, a Mothra egg can be seen on a computer screen with a very similar design to the original Mothra eggs from the old school Godzilla films. But anyways, a little later, after Emma uses the Orca to tap into the alpha frequency and calm Mothra down, we get this wide shot of Madison reaching out to this revered moth goddess in a tribute to Michelangelo's creation of Adam at the Sistine Chapel, which features Adam reaching his hand out to God. This beautiful moment is of course interrupted by the arrival of the eco-terrorist Alan Jonah, played by Charles Dance. 
a former colonel in the British Army before a stint at MI6, Jonah's long profession in the war business has caused him to develop a hatred for humanity, leading him to believe that humanity itself was a virus that needed to be eradicated for the good of the planet. In the novelization of Godzilla King of the Monsters, we learn that the kidnapping and brutal murder of Jonah's daughter Lindy was a major factor to Jonah turning on humanity as well. So Alan and Emma definitely have something in common there, as they both have lost their kids. But anyways, as the scene changes to the Senate hearing at Washington DC, we can see footage of Godzilla fighting the Jinshin Mushi Mudo from the 2014 film, as well as Bill Randa's footage of Kong that we saw him recording before those helicopters flew too damn close to the sun in Kong Skull Island. But anyways, after Monarch picks Mark up from taking photographs of wolves, they hand Mark a tablet full of monsters. As Mark swipes through that tablet, we can see x-rays of a number of titans, including including Mothra, Rodan, Godzilla, the draconic mountain titan Methuselah, the armored spider titan Scylla, the mammoth titan Behemoth, and of course, our favorite king of Skull Island, Kong. Dr. Serizawa then tells Mark that Monarch had 17 different sites around the world where they were monitoring different titans that they've found. In Europe, we have the Loch Ness Monster, aka Leviathan, at Outpost 49, and the Mountain Kaiju Methuselah in Munich, Germany, at Outpost 67. In Africa, we got the Unseen Titan Baphomet in Morocco at Outpost 68, the Long-Tailed Lion Titan Sekhmet in Cairo, Egypt, at Outpost 65, and the mythical Makole Mbembe Horned River Titan in Sudan, at Outpost 75. Moving on over to Asia, we can see Monarch monitoring the foliage camouflaging Kaiju Amhaluk over in Russia at Outpost 66, Mothra at Outpost 61 in China, the eight-headed serpent deity of Japanese myth Orochi is over at Outpost 91 at Mount Fuji, Japan, and Angkor Wat Cambodia holds the mysterious Titan Typhon. The Titan Bunyip can be found chilling in Australia at Outpost 99 as that continent's only Titan. Moving on to North America, Devil's Tower, Wyoming has got the monster Abaddon over at Outpost 77. Sedona, Arizona's Outpost 55 holds the spider kaiju Scylla. Stone Mountain, Georgia has the bioluminescent water dragon Tiamat at Outpost 53. Isla de Mara watches over Rodan at Outpost 56 in Mexico. And Castle Bravo over in Bermuda monitors God's Godzilla over at Outpost 54, with Outpost 54 being a nod to both the American military's failed attempts to blow up Godzilla using the Castle Bravo bomb at Bikini Atoll in 1954, as well as the first Godzilla film, which released in 1954. In South America, we've got the Mammoth Behemoth in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil at Outpost 58, and Machu Picchu, Peru has got the Titan Quetzalcoatl over at Outpost 57. And of course, Kong is chilling over at Skull Island, being monitored at Outpost 33, later to be moved to a new domed Outpost 236 by the events of Godzilla vs. Kong. Outpost 33 is a nod to the year 1933, which is the year of the first King Kong movie. And finally, King Ghidorah has been frozen in Antarctica at Monarch Outpost 32, an outpost that would be hijacked by Alan Jonah and all of his men. But the question still remains, how the hell did Ghidorah even get here in the first place. Well, according to director Michael Doherty on Twitter, King Ghidorah was left to freeze in Antarctica after losing badly to Godzilla in the region millions of years ago. And while designing King Ghidorah, the VFX team was specifically told to focus on making them look the way that they do in Eastern mythologies, as opposed to how the West tends to design their dragons. The director specifically stating that he didn't want the dragons to look anything like they did in the Western produced Game of Thrones series. And to craft King Ghidorah's look, they also studied the look and movements of King Cobra and Rattlesnakes for inspiration. And you can definitely hear the sound of a rattlesnake whenever Ghidorah shakes their tail. But what's particularly great about King Ghidorah is how they literally have three dudes covered in ping pong balls crawl next to each other in order to capture the motion of this ancient Hydra dragon. But anyways, when the group arrives at Monarch Outpost 54, we get the lowdown on Alan Jonah's motivations to use Kaiju, leading Dr. Rick Stanton to bring up the potential advancements that Titan DNA could have in the fields of pharmaceuticals, bioweapons, and food, and how many nations and organizations across the world are hungry to study these titans for profit, foreshadowing the coming of Apex Cybernetics to the MonsterVerse. As we would learn in both Godzilla vs. Kong and Monarch Legacy of Monsters, that Apex wanted to use Titan DNA to become the ultimate Apex Predator of the world. But anyways, after Mark and Monarch get up close and personal with Godzilla, they try to track him in hopes of finding the Orca and the Russell girls 
When trying to figure out how Godzilla could have disappeared from their trackers, Dr. Stanton brings up Dr. Houston Brooks and his Hollow Earth theory both introduced in the 2017 prequel movie Kong Skull Island. The younger version of Dr. Brooks was played by actor Corey Hawkins in Skull Island, while the older, modern-day version of the character appears later on in this film, played by actor Joe Morton. But anyways, a little later, after Emma wakes up King Ghidorah, I love how Ghidorah spreads his wings as wide as possible as Godzilla emerges onto the scene because it's very much how birds tend to intimidate other animals in the wild. But while we are talking about this face-off, notice how different Godzilla's dorsal fins look compared to how they were presented in the 2014 film. Like, they look a lot more accurate to the classic dorsal fin look from the original Godzilla films. There's actually a canonical reason for this detailed in the prequel comic Godzilla Aftershock which reveals that not long after the events of the first movie, Godzilla had all of his back fins completely blown off during a fight with the Alpha Jinshin Mushi Mudo. So his fins look completely different in this movie because new, more evolved fins grew in their place. And it's not just the fins that evolved, Godzilla's actual size went through a bit of evolution from 2014 as well. Because in 2014's Godzilla movie, Godzilla was 355 feet tall, whereas in this movie, Godzilla has grown to a whopping 393 feet. Which is primarily why your boy Godzilla always be getting busy on the basketball court. Because your boy gets the verticality. But unfortunately for Godzilla, King Ghidorah is clearly a lot taller, as that malicious monster stands at a crazy 521 feet tall. But anyways, after this initial meeting of the gods, Emma Russell then FaceTimes Monarch to let them know of her plans to use Titan radiation to bring life back to the planet at the cost of a couple million lives, leading Emma to activating this sleeping Rodan from a nearby volcano at Outpost 56 in Isla de Maro, Mexico. When designing Rodan, director Michael Doherty looked at the body language and features of a number of predatory birds of the sky, in particular vultures, hawks, and eagles. And in order to create Rodan's screeches for the movie, he also used recordings from vultures, cranes, penguins, and owls, which is extra wild. Doherty refers to Rodan as the king of the skies, and you can definitely see this during his fight with the American military. And we can see this exemplified the best during this movie when Rodan follows the advice of the great philosopher Peppy the Hare from Star Fox and does a devastating barrel roll to absolutely obliterate the pilots trying to take him down. Like, I love how he seems to smirk at one of the pilots trying to get away from him before he does this because it shows just how much more adept to the skies that he is in comparison to all of these hairless apes flying their fragile toys. But then Rodan of course finds himself going head to head with the big bad King Ghidorah. And when they do, I love the movie's decision to make the background reflect this face off by having the clouds split this frame down the middle, giving the flaming Rodan the side of the bright burning sun and Ghidorah the cloudy darker side to match his darker evil nature. But unfortunately, Rodan would of course lose this fight, with Godzilla losing to King Ghidorah not too long after Rodan as a result of the US military's hasty detonation of their oxygen destroyer bomb forcing Godzilla to retreat to his underwater home within an ancient temple built by a civilization that used to revere him. There, Godzilla would have spent a long period of time licking his wounds and healing from that fight, time that humanity no longer had as Ghidorah would let out an alpha predator screech from atop Rodan's volcanic home that called for every dormant kaiju on the planet to bow down to his apocalyptic rule. I love the framing of Ghidorah dwarfing this Christian cross in the foreground because it truly symbolizes just how much this dragon devil has seemingly overcome humanity's savior Godzilla. However, during their fight, Godzilla would wound the great Ghidorah by ripping Kevin straight off of his body, a head that we would see appear again in the post credit scene of the movie as one of the fishermen from Isla de Mara sells Kevin's head to Alan Jonah at the end of the film, a dragon head that Jonah would apparently sell to the douchebags at Apex Cybernetics in order for them to study and create the Mechagodzilla mental interface. So technically, Mechagodzilla had the mind of Kevin, which is kind of funny. <laughs> But anyways, Ghidorah's cry would of course trigger Titans to begin to emerge from their dormant hiding spots. Starting with Scylla over at Outpost 55 in Arizona, followed by Methuselah at Germany's Outpost 67, Yamata no Orochi at Outpost 91 at Mount Fuji, Japan, and Makole Mbembe from Sudan's Outpost 75. And right after this, we head back to Monarch Outpost 61 to watch the completed metamorphosis of Mothra's winged form with Houston Brooks and Dr. Ling Chen. Speaking of Dr. 
Dr. Ling Chen, she and her twin sister Eileen are two living Easter eggs in this movie, as they were confirmed to be an adaptation of the Shobijin Twin Priestesses of Mothra by director Michael Doherty himself twin priestesses that first appeared in the 1961 Mothra film. Infant Island, the name of the island that these twin priestesses lived on, is referenced in the photograph of Eileen and Ling's mother and grandmother, who did some work on Infant Island as monarch agents in the past. This would explain why both the Chen women are both obsessed with both Mothra and mythology in this movie. Both Eileen and Ling are played by the same actress, Zhang Ziyi. But anyways, a little later, the monarch agents on the ship all look at the same ancient art artwork of Godzilla fighting Ghidorah that Conrad and Weaver got shown during the post credit scene of Kong Skull Island. Then shortly after, as Admiral Stenz gives his briefing, we get footage of all of the titans around the world wreaking havoc on the human population, starting with Scylla in Arizona, followed by Behemoth in Brazil, and then Methuselah in Germany. During this briefing, however, I did notice that the soldiers of the G-Team all wear patches that say Mythis Noster Pyxis, which roughly translates to Myths Are Our Compass, a phrase that Eileen Chen says to Mark earlier in the film. On their patches, we can see a winged creature on them with an appearance similar to that of Rodan. But anyways, Madison then stealthily sneaks out of captivity with the orca and heads to Fenway Park in Boston, Massachusetts, a park whose mascot is the Green Monster, which I thought was very fitting, all things considered. But anyways, after Mothra emerges and helps Monarch find Godzilla's location, Dr. Sirizawa sacrifices himself to save Godzilla as a tribute to the character Daisuke Sirizawa, who does a similar sacrifice with the oxygen destroyer bomb in the 1954 Godzilla film. However, as the bomb goes off and begins to engulf Godzilla's temple home, right outside of the temple, the skeletal remains of the kaiju Gyrus can be seen. Gyrus, who first made his appearance in 1955's Godzilla Raids Again, is a longtime Turtle Titan Godzilla ally throughout the classic movies. And after this, a newly revived Godzilla shoots out a blast of atomic breath into the sky, likely as a way to remove the excess atomic radiation from his body from that blast. This of course leads to the final battle in Boston, where the very short-lived Mothra gives her life to save Godzilla from one of Ghidorah's blasts. However, due to their symbiotic relationship, the very act of Mothra dying over Godzilla's body allowed Godzilla to absorb her bioenergy in order to turn into his burning Godzilla form, a form that we saw for the first First time in 1995's Godzilla vs. Destroya. Using this new form, Burning Godzilla is able to finally destroy King Ghidorah and rally the rest of the monsters throughout the planet to him, with Behemoth, Scylla, Ajinshin Mushi, and Rodan all showing up to bow down to the king. And after this, the credits play to a cover of Blue Oyster Cult's 1997 hit Godzilla and gives us a bunch of news articles and images, much like how Godzilla 2014 and Kong Skull Island opened. During this montage, we see that Monarch has released all 60 years of all of their monster data to the public, which is crazy for such a historically secretive organization. We then find out that Rodan chose to settle inside a volcano north of Fiji, which is pretty fun, followed by the extremely great news that a rainforest has popped up in the Sahara Desert, the Pacific coral reefs were returning, the deforested parts of the Amazon were growing back, and the ice caps were melting slower all as a result of Titan radiation. And 14 species of animals were even taken off of the endangered list as a result of all this, which is nuts. So Emma Russell's actions actually did end up saving the planet in the long run, even though she did not survive to see this new planet. And this is pretty much why we see shortly after this that humanity is considering using Titan poop as a viable energy source. So definitely expect Titan radiation to play a big part in humanity's evolution moving forward in this monsterverse, because I am damn sure that Apex Cybernetics are not the only entities out there looking to benefit off of hollow earth radiation. Then, after showing us a number of dragon images from various cultures throughout history, we get articles hinting towards the seismic activity on Skull Island, leading to an increased presence there. This is of course meant to tease the next MonsterVerse film, Godzilla vs. Kong, with the movie ending with an ancient drawing detailing Godzilla and Kong's historic rivalry. But my personal favorite piece of news that came from the credits comes in the form of this article that teases the coming of a second Mothra, as humanity would find another Mothra egg within Mothra's territory. So I'm super excited to see what this new Mothra looks 
like in the future of the MonsterVerse. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of Godzilla King of the Monsters. What did you guys think of this movie? Let us know in the comment section down below. And of course, like always, you can follow me at Mastertainment on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and wherever I am on the internet, and also at the Guardians of the Galaxy podcast, where me and my two friends just talk about nerd stuff and nerd news in a really fun way. So check that out if you like fun stuff. But most importantly, follow Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube. And when you do, hit that notification bell so that you can get notifications every time we upload a video. And again, if you guys want to get content sooner than everybody else, become a member today. It's only 99 cents, so it is literally a steal of a deal. But again, thank you guys so much for watching. I love you guys so much, and I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.